Well, let's come to the Word of God again together this evening. If you would, turn in the New Testament with me to Paul's epistle to the Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And the theme of the whole book of Colossians is completion in Christ. Christ completed the work of salvation and redemption on the cross of Calvary. When we come to Christ by grace through faith, believe and receive him as our saviour, we are complete in Christ and we receive the completed work of Christ. If you will, it's a singular truth, singular truth. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, uh, just going to read the first six verses uh, just to get the flow, starting from verse 1, really just mainly looking at verse 5 and 6 this evening. But let's uh, read from verse number 1 of chapter 1 to the end of verse number 6. The Word of God says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints, or the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. And we'll end our reading there this evening. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless your word of truth. Bless the gospel. I pray you bless the message, Lord, and uh, help this messenger, Father, tonight to bring my thoughts and your word together that you may empower it, bless it, and use it mightily for the cause and glory of Jesus Christ and the spread of your eternal gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, the title of the message is The Singularity. The Singularity. Now, that's a term that some of you may have heard. The singularity has been much banded about for many years. It's found some popularity again recently with some writings. You know, on uh, not Tuesday, on Thursday, when we were in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 43, we were looking at some, some elements of things in relation to the end times. Uh, and I touched on uh, some of the, uh, the things that are going on in the world today, uh, you know, in relation to, if you will, DNA manipulation, transhumanism, and artificial intelligence. We just touched on a few of those things. Now, what I'd like to do tonight, if I can, is just is just show you, because this singularity has been spoken about a lot, and that relates to artificial intelligence. Now, before you go running away, this isn't going to be a message about artificial intelligence, okay? But what I want to show you is how we can, this fluff and stuff of the world that it keeps pushing out, that's got one message, fear and subjugation, how we can understand what it is for just a few moments and then we can sling it in the bin where it belongs and bring it to the word of God and see why we shouldn't be worried about these things. Now, if you've never heard of the singularity, okay, and you may not have done, but hopefully you have. We've heard a lot about it on radio and, and, and everything. It's, it's out there all the time. It's actually the technological singularity is what it is, but it's just referred to as the singularity. It's spoken of about a lot. And it's a it's a hypothetical point in time in which technological growth of artificial intelligence will become uncontrollable and irreversible. The day of the robots, friends. Beware, beware the day of the robots, the end of humanity. This will, in theory, result in unforeseeable changes and unchangeable changes in human civilization. In fact, I've got it written here, according to the most popular version of the singularity hypothesis called intelligence explosion. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. There's been an explosion of some intelligence for people who believe this. An upgradable intelligent, uh, intelligent agent will eventually enter a runaway reaction of self-improvement cycles, each new and more intelligent generation appearing more and more rapidly, causing an explosion in intelligence 
and resulting in a powerful superintelligence that qualitatively far surpasses all human intelligence. So do you understand? At the moment, AI in theory is limited by our human intelligence and our ability to program it. Eventually, what it's saying is artificial intelligence will outrun the human brain and it will start improving itself and go beyond our mental capacities and end up with a super intelligence that puts paid to all human life having the upper hand, if you will. The day of the robot will come. People will be eliminated. This is how it goes. Now, this is a reality. I'm not making this stuff up. This isn't sci-fi, by the way. This is new to you. I'm sorry. It's not new at all. It's been around for years, but it's finding new purchase uh, at the moment. Now, it's, if you will, it's centered on the accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life, which gives the appearance, the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the human race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. Now you say, this is, this is nonsense, this is science fiction. You, you know, now, now let me just give you a couple of names of people who've spoken on this, names you may recognize. First one is Stephen Hawking. Now I know he's dead now, but you know, he's held up as one of the super intelligent humans that's ever lived. What about Elon Musk? Have you heard of him? Tesla cars, SpaceX rocket, you know, all you Facebook generation and Instagram generation, you kind of fail to have heard of Elon Musk. Now, he might be a bit crazy if you look at the name that him and him and his wife what, named his child, I don't know, X dot exclamation mark, unpronounceable nonsense. You may wonder if he, if he really is the intelligence behind SpaceX and Tesla. I, I understand that. But public figures such as Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk have expressed concern that full artificial intelligence, AI, could result in human extinction. The consequences of the singularity and its potential benefit for harm to the human race have been intensely debated. Okay, so you get the scope and scale of this thing. Man invents the machine, man programs the machine, man takes the machine to the limit of our brain capacity of our brain capacity, the machine then takes over, perfects itself, improves itself, and then takes over and eliminates the human race. Intelligent people, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, well, question mark, intelligent people, around the world, they write books on it, they talk about it, the day is coming. The average man driving to work in his car hears this stuff on radio and thinks, oh, no, it's going to be the end of the world as we know it. And once again, from media and everything else, fear takes over. Can I take the singularity from the world and just show you what you need to do with it if you have any fear that the machine is going to take over and sling it out the window where it belongs? So well, how do you know, Pastor? Surely you're not some kind of uh, theoretical physicist and astro. I'm not. So, well, how can you possibly know that artificial intelligence isn't going to take over and eliminate the human race? Hello, because I have the supreme intelligence before me, the word of God from the supremely intelligent and supremely powerful being of God. And you know what it says? It says when Jesus Christ comes again, there'll be people, not machines. Jesus Christ, when he comes again for the church, people. Jesus Christ, when he comes again in his second coming to bring judgment, it's going to be on people, not machines. So that worldly singularity talks about a super intelligence bringing humanity into submission. Can I talk to you about the true singularity? Because there is a singularity and there is a singularity that involves a super powerful intelligence that tells people to come into submission. And we find it here in Colossians chapter one. Now, just before we look at that, just go to Second Corinthians chapter 10. If you're one of these people who gets worried about all these things you see out there in the world. You know, your imagination starts running away with you all the time. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, and it doesn't matter whether it's ANR, AI, artificial intelligence, DNA manipulation, 5G, you know, you can put whatever it is on there. If you find that by listening and watching, you spend too much time listening and watching to junk. So what can I do about it? I'm, I'm worried. I'm fearful. I'm fretful. 
Let me just give you one verse. Mark this verse down. Keep this verse. If you're one of those people that's really worried by these things that you hear and see and your mind runs away from the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse number five. Casting down imaginations. AI, machines, singularity, super intelligence, taking over the world, suppressing, coming the human race. It's an imagination, friend. It doesn't match the truth of the Bible. Casting down. Throw it away from you. Casting down imaginations and every high thing. Look, these thoughts of Stephen Hawkins, Elon Musk, and these people are right about these stuff. They are every high thing, but their imaginations, every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Take these conspiracy imaginations. You know, somebody said it was one of those positive mental attitude speakers years ago. I don't know if it was Norman Vincent Peale or which one it was. said, what the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Now, listen, there is no break upon that which the wickedness of man can achieve. The only stopper, the only breaker to that is God. Super creator, super intelligence. So God says, when we hear these imaginative stories, when we hear these high things that talk about man made in the image of God is going to be nothing more than fodder for an artificial intelligence. It says we've got to cast it down. We've got to bring it into captivity. Every thought that starts racing all over the place, get it in the word of God. Let God's word feed your mind and cleanse your mind. Bring those thoughts of nonsense into captivity. So is there going to be a singularity? There already is a singularity. It's in the word of God. Colossians chapter one. Let's look at this tonight. Firstly, let's look at the singularity in verse number five. Now, if you've got a pen, a highlighter, a marker, an underliner or whatever you do, look here with me in verse number five and you can underline the singularity, the real singularity. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. That's the singularity that counts. That's the singularity that comes from a supreme intelligence from the word of God. That's the singularity that makes the difference to mankind. And that's the singularity under which mankind should come under submission to a supreme intelligence, but it's not artificial, it's God. You see, do we see this? Let's look at the singularity. And, and there's a multiplicity of them there, but they form one singularity for the hope. There are lots of things people hope for in this world, but there's only one hope, and only those who are saved have true hope. You see, because it's God's hope. It's heavenly hope. It's eternal hope. It's sure hope, and it is the hope of every single Christian. It's the singular hope. Because it's not a hope in us. It's not a hope in a wish. It's not a hope in a, in a something that might happen. It's, a, it's an absolute certainty because the singularity for the saved is the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. It's the hope that the superintelligence gives to the submissive intelligence. When we submit ourselves to the Lord, to Christ and his word, then we gain the singularity of the hope which is laid up in heaven. What's it based upon? Well, the hope is based upon, look down with me now, the word, again in verse number five. Would you notice the definite article, the hope, the word? Notice the singularity. There are not multiple hopes in this world, in reality, there's only one. That hope is in Christ. What's it based on? The word. So what's the word? That's the source. That's the source of the hope. You see, our hope is based on a source, and our source is the word, which is the Holy Bible, the word of God. I believe that to be perfect and preserved in the King James Bible. I don't say that to make you mad. I've seen some Christians get real mad about those things. I mean, they're, they're, they're almost, you know, weeping and wailing of gnashing of teeth. Listen, 
Did God ever do anything that was imperfect? And you can only answer no to that. If you think God did something that was imperfect and you're a Christian, I don't know the God that you know. My God is a perfect God. His work is a perfect work. And his word is a perfect word. Now, if you haven't found out where that is yet, that's fine. You can be out there in doubt. You can be out there searching. You can be out there looking and you can be out there open. But I'm telling you, the hope whereof ye heard before in the word. See, God's word can't be everywhere in various forms, can it? And it certainly can't be everywhere in opposing forms or contradictory forms or mistaken forms. If it's God's word, it is the word, it is singular, and it is singularly perfect. Praise the Lord. It's a singularity. So there's the hope, the word, which is the source. There's a source of what? Look with me still. Verse number five, the word of the truth. There's only one truth. By the very nature, there can be only one truth, because if all things are truth, then nothing is truth. You can't have multiple truths that contradict one another because then they can't all be true. So there's only one truth. And if it's not true, it's false. And so God's singularity said there is a singular hope. There is a singular word that contains a singular truth. You see, the truth of God is not false. The truth of God has substance. We don't have the singularity of our hope and the word of God based upon wishing. We're not wishing that it would be true. We're not wishing there was some word. We're not guessing. We have singularity, the truth. And if it's not truth, it's false. Do you know where the truth is, my friend? Do you know where the eternal truth is? God's perfect truth that gives you perfect hope. Do you know where that is? It's a singularity. There's not multiple hopes, multiple words, multiple truths. By the very nature, they could not be self-defeating. But look, he still hasn't finished. Verse number five, we've got the hope, the word, the truth of the gospel. Good tidings, good news. That's what gospel means. God says there is only one singular, the good news. There's only one lot of good news. And that's salvation. That is what the gospel is. The gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we are told the gospel, the singular gospel, the singular good news is believing in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Do you see, the gospel contains the truth, which is in the word, which gives us the hope, singularity, not a multiplicity. You see, the gospel is the truth. You say, well, there's many religions out there. That's quite an audacious claim that you make. There are many faiths out there. Who who on earth could you be to say that there is any one truth? Well, firstly, I haven't said it. God did. So I've got a problem with that. I've got a problem with what you're saying. Can I tell you you haven't got a problem with what I'm saying? Because I'm just saying to you what's written in God's word. If you've got a problem with that, you've got a problem with God's word. You don't have a problem with me. I'm just a messenger of God's word. We heard from Jeremiah tonight. They threw him in a pit because they didn't like God's word. You say, well, I I, I don't like that. We want to throw you in a pit. Well, this is God's message, and it's a singularity. You say, why? Because you say, well, there's lots of religions, lots of faith out there. Can I tell you what? It's just gambling. Religion is just gambling. Uh, Have you ever heard of Russian roulette? You know, I was unsaved until I was 39 years old. You may never have read about it. You may never have seen such a film. But uh, let me fill you in on what it is. Russian roulette, they did this uh, to prisoners of war in the Vietnam War. Viet Cong took American prisoners of war. They sat two of them, one against the other, on a table. They'd put a cloth around their head, a headband around their head. They'd take a revolver, put one bullet in it, spin it around, lock up the chamber, pass it on to one. What did that What did that prisoner of war have to do? He had to take the gun. He had to put it to the temple of his head. He had to pull the trigger. 
If he heard a click, then he went. But six rounds in the chamber, down went the gun, then the gun went over to the other prisoner. Well, now he's got a one in five chance, hasn't he? He had to pick up the gun. Click. Live or die. Spiritual. A Russian roulette. That's what religion is. Well, I hope that when I get to heaven and pull the trigger, God says life. That's all religion is. It's spiritual roulette. You're gambling with your eternal hope because religion will not give you a guarantee. Religion says do the best you can, work hard, keep laboring, and when you die, let's just hope you've done enough. So what's that spiritual roulette? When you get there, God may say, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Off to hell, purgatory, or whatever nonsense they've invented. Off you go. The hope, the word, the truth, the gospel is a singularity of absolute certainty, of absolute truth from an absolute God. And it's a certainty for you. It's personal. For the hope which is laid up for you. Do you see the hope, the word, the truth, and the gospel is for you. We have an individual requirement to respond before God. That requirement is an individual requirement. The hope is for you. The truth is for you. The word is for you. The gospel is for you. It is singularly for you. What will you do with that? That's the singularity, my friend. Isn't that wonderful? I like the fact that God deals in singularities. It makes it really simple. I can read it. I can understand it. I can make a decision based upon it. And I am then responsible for what I do with it. It's not confusion. It's not a multiplicity. It's a singularity. And God gives us a singularity. You say, well, you know, I live in a world where we don't like black and white. I live in a world where we don't like singularities. We live in a world... It's full of diversity. Well, would you look with me? Because that's the second thing we're going to see tonight, that within the singularity is diversity. Or well, many people may say it in this way, inclusivity. You know, um, we need to live in an inclusive world that embraces everything. Well, that's not quite true. God gives us a singularity, but he shows us the scope of the diversity or the inclusivity, if you will, in verse number six. He's shown us the hope, the word, the truth, the gospel. Now look at this in verse number six, which has come unto you personally to everyone as it is in all the world, all the world. No limitation, no exclusivity, no exclusion, no intolerance. God's singularity has absolute diversity in that the hope, the word, the truth, and the gospel comes to the entire world. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language, every nationality, every culturally religious group gets the opportunity for the truth of God's word all the world. Now, do you know what that is? That's true love. That's God's true love letter to this world. That is true compassion. That is true care. That is true concern. God is so concerned, compassionate, and caring that he takes a single, simple, absolute truth, and he says the whole world can receive this truth. The whole world gets the opportunity. The whole world gets Equality. We have equality of opportunity. That's, I think, one of the buzz phrases that we have today. Everybody's got to have equality of opportunity. Every workplace, school place, we hear that buzzword. We've got to ensure there's equality of opportunity. But with fallen man, it isn't always true, but not so with God. He says, the hope, the word, the truth, and the gospel has an inclusivity because it's going to all the world. No exclusions, no limitations, absolute diversity. Do you know what? We hear a lot of talk today, don't we, about globalization. 
You know, you can go down to Kuala Lumpur and get a Costa coffee. It's ridiculous, isn't it? You see these symbols of globalization all over the world. I was watching a video of somebody I like to watch on the internet the other day. It's like a traveling type thing. And they're down there in Kuala Lumpur. And I was saying, Kuala Lumpur, that, that looks like a Costa wrapper. And lo and behold, as the camera panned out, there it was, Kuala Lumpur. Costa. Good night, man. Well, what's it like? I mean, it might, you can go, I've been to India uh, years ago, New Delhi, McDonald's. I mean, it doesn't matter where you globalization, global brands, okay? You say, what's that? That's diversity. It is. It's diversity of robbery. These global brands go to countries around the world. They hold governments to ransom. They, they, what do they want? Do they want to bring love, care, and compassion? No, they want to take your money. It doesn't matter how poor you are. So Hollywood and social media, they sell a brand. And you get to the point where even in the poorest most undeveloped nations, people are queuing up to get one of these Western globalization uh, coffees or burgers. But God's diversity is true globalization because it's not capitalistic. He is offering free singularity of hope, word, truth, and the gospel to all people everywhere, to all time, no restrictions. No limitations. I tell you what, that is true diversity, my friend. The only true diversity and inclusivity comes from God. He makes an offer to sinners who are everywhere in every nation that all can be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Do you know what, though? There's wicked people in this world. Do you know there are wicked people in this world who would prevent the global spread of the gospel? Do you know there are unsaved people out there who say how wrong it is? to bring the gospel to other cultures. We mustn't, as if Christianity is, is some kind of westernized global conglomerate. How dare you take the gospel to India? How dare you tell a Muslim he needs to be saved? How dare you tell a tribal Indian they need to be saved? How, how dare you go to another country? That's just wicked. Is it? To take a free message of God's free love and free redemption to a sinner who can be saved with the opera of eternity where he gets the hope, the word, the truth, and the gospel, no matter age, gender, tribe, tongue, or nation. That's wicked. Man, you're wicked if you think that. You are so wicked, it's unbelievable. That's uh, Listen, if you, if, you, if you saw a man walking past you, walking down the street, you said, where are you going? He said, well, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a factory on fire down there. I'm just going along to throw myself in and save myself the cremation costs. I mean, would you say that guy, good idea, well done, saving money. I don't want you getting away, buddy. Why, why don't you just go and throw yourself in the fire and burn yourself to death? You'd have to be some kind of sick nut to allow that. Well, how is it any different when we know lost sinners will end up in the eternal fires of hell. And you turn around and say, don't go and take them and save them from the fire. Let them go and throw themselves on the fire. You are wicked. If you think the gospel should not be taken. And listen, I'm talking about unsaved people at the moment. I'm talking about the wickedness of unsaved people. That is wicked and that is nonsense. People need to be saved. And this is what God said, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. The free offer of salvation does not know borders. It does not know limitation. God's love and care is for all. And the gospel of good tidings, the ministry of reconciliation between God and man is available to all of all nations as a free gift. And if you don't think the only true free globalization benefit to the entire world shouldn't cross borders, then you are one sick puppy, my friend. You're sick. You are wicked. You're condemning people to hell. If you're one of those people that take a stand against the message of Christ, the good news going anywhere and everywhere unrestricted, if you stand against that because of your pride-filled, wicked stupidity, then there is something wrong with you, you sick man. You say, well, it doesn't work. It's not true. Well, that's fine. That's fine. You can believe that. But why would you stop it? 
There's lots of things in this world that people don't agree with, but what's the thing you start jumping up and down about? The truth. Do you know why? Because Satan has got a hold of you, and Satan opposes God. And if you're in opposition to the gospel, you're in opposition to God. And like Jesus Christ said to that crowd in John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil. You are the adversary. And in the name of Jesus, then you be gone, you wicked thing. There's wicked people who would prevent the global spread of the gospel. We talked about it this morning, didn't we, uh, in, 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 uh, in the prayers about the Hindu nationalists in India. We said, this is a Hindu nation, no Christians can come in here. Listen, God will go and be wherever, but it's the same wickedness. We are going to put up barriers. We are going to put up blocks. We are going to stop this free offer and hope of the gospel coming in. You know, a lot of people in the West, you know, when you speak to them, we, we go out on outreach, we go out on the streets, we go and knock on doors, we talk to people. And a lot of people in the West love to think they're Buddhists, don't they? Have you, have you come across that? Oh, yeah, I follow Buddhism. Why, why is that? Well, it's just so peace-loving. You know, Christianity is not, Christianity is hypocritical, Christianity is colonial, whatever it is, some kind of stupid nonsense that they rattle off without any thought whatsoever. Buddhism is, a, is just so peace-loving. Have you ever been to Nepal? Buddhist nationalists will not let the gospel anymore. It is now illegal in Nepal to evangelize, to spread the gospel. In the name of what? Peace? No, that's protectionism then. There's no diversity in that. There's no diversity in Hindu nationalism. There's no diversity in Buddhist nationalism. Oh, there's, there are people of peace. Well, if there are people of peace, then let peace come in. What are they worried? They're worried about their little wooden gods are going to get knocked over by the true God. They're going to be like the statue of Dagon that ended up flat in his face when Samson was taken. Is that how it's going to be? I don't know. Is it going to come crumbling down? There's wicked people who would prevent the global spread of the gospel. They're on side. Can I say this, though? And this is a really sad thing. There's a lot of foolish people who say they're Christians who have no heart for the global spread of the gospel. Foolishness. Nonsense. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. The gospel commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we're not may, we may not be a big church. We may not be a powerful church. But I tell you this, we will always be, well, so long as I'm standing behind this pulpit, a missions-hearted, missions-minded, missions-orientated church. And if that doesn't suit you, friend, you're in the wrong church. If that suits you, then get along to this church. We do so little and we want to do more. Do you know why? Because God's plan is for all the world to hear the gospel, the offer of the truth. Church planting missionaries around the world. That's the plan from when Jesus Christ even instituted the church. From once he was rejected by the na uh, nation of Israel, the plan was to go to all the nations of the world with the gospel. Go to Luke 24, Luke 24. Well, you know, I, I hear a lot of dumb fools in church. I hear some of them, even in our church, I don't think that's God's plan to support missionaries. Don't you? Well, go and find another church that believes what you believe in. We'll carry on doing what the Bible calls us to do. You go and take your miserable, sorry carcass somewhere else. Luke 24. I'm in the wrong chapter. I'm in Luke 4. Let me just catch up with you. Luke 24. The singularity, the diversity. I just love the fact that the gospel is to go to all the world. I, I, I love the fact that this morning we could take the time in our fellowship and we could read an update letter from our missionary partner in India. We heard about souls that were saved in India. You know what? I couldn't put my boots on the ground, but I could put my prayers on the ground. I could put my money on the ground. I could enable someone in India. We could play a part in prayer and provision to see souls saved. You say, why? That's what the Lord wants. Luke 24 and verse number 47. Uh, well, uh, let's start at 46. And said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So this is the, uh, uh, the resurrection Power, this is the resurrection provision. Verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached 
in his name among what does that say all nations beginning at jerusalem all nations that's the diversity that's the inclusivity that's the charge the call and the commission of the gospel can you be in all nations at once are you omnipresent like god is i'm certainly not but you know what by prayer and provision I can have a part in a ministry in India. By prayer and provision, I can have a ministry in a part in Honduras. By prayer and provision, I can have a ministry in a part in, in, in Ireland. By prayer and provision, I can have a part in a ministry in Australia and Papua New Guinea. Do you know what? So I can be a part of getting the gospel to all nations. We can be a part in our church of getting the gospel to all nations. Well, I don't think that. Do you know, it, it's amazing, isn't it? There's so many spiritual Christians that seem so spiritual till it involves getting the hand in the wallet. And then a McDonald's or something is far more important. The singularity, the diversity, and lastly tonight, the maturity. This is what makes the difference. Look again in verse number six, which is come unto you of Colossians chapter one, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Now, would you notice the conjunction there? It says, the hope, the word, the truth, the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit. Every Christian who's been impacted by the hope, word, truth of the gospel, who has known the grace of God in truth, every Christian brings forth fruit. Now, there is fruit, of course, of souls saved, but that isn't the fruit that this is talking about. This is, if you will, talking about the fruits of righteousness, the fruit of the Christian life. You know, the apple tree grows apples and the orange tree grows oranges. And if whatever's planted is digged and dung for three years and it hasn't come forth with anything, then it should be torn up because something is wrong. Fruit is what should come forth. Bring it forth fruit in you. Don't look at everybody else's fruit. Don't look at what everyone else is doing. Don't look at how everyone else is changing. Look at you. Every one of us must look at ourselves. Now, a quick look. We won't look there tonight. Matthew's gospel alone. But if you did a quick look in Matthew's gospel, you'll find there's good fruit, evil fruit, and corrupt fruit. Good fruit, evil fruit, and corrupt fruit. Well, good and evil is a great contrast. You know, evil fruit shouldn't be found if there's good fruit, but there is corrupt fruit as well. It can get corrupted. You know, it's a great truth, and it's, it's an incredible truth, and it's a powerful truth, and it's a common truth of the Scriptures, that when we know the Word of God, the hope of God, the gospel of God, the truth of God, when we know the grace of God through salvation, then God wants to work out in our lives and bring forth Christian fruit, sweet-looking, sweet-tasting fruit. And that's the picture. So often we, we stop with the word of God at salvation as if that's where God stops. And he has so much more in his grace to give us. Now, we're very good at being the fruit analyzers and the fruit inspectors. I mean, you know, fruit does need an analyzer. Fruit needs an inspector. It needs labeling up. It needs quality control. You know, when it gets into the supermarket, you don't want to be picking up every orange and apple. You know, top side look good and bottom sides all manky, moldy and bruised and squidgy with maggots all crawling out. You know, the fruit should match what it is supposed to be. And it's the same. It's the same with the Lord. The danger is for us as Christians, especially for some reason Bible-believing Christians, we all want to be fruit inspectors instead of fruit exhibitors. We all want to inspect everyone else's fruit and make a decision based on everyone else's fruit and what it is, uh, you know, uh, that we should despise in their life because it's not good fruit coming forth. Can I say this? If we would despise first in ourselves that for which we would despise in others, we would live a far more fruitful Christian life, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. As we have a personal responsibility to the singularity, we have a personal responsibility to allow the Lord to bring forth fruit. Now, this is important because I want to tell you this. Living the Christian life is an impossibility 
that is beyond our ability in our humanity to bring forth the fruit that God speaks of. Notice this is a continuance for the hope. We have the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit. The fruit in the Christian life, the fruit in my Christian life, your Christian life, the fruit that comes forth is a product of God's grace and work in us. It's the work of God's word in us, God's hope in us. It's the grace of God in truth. It is God's supernatural work in us to bring forth fruit. So often we fail because we're trying to do it in our willpower. We're trying to act fruit. We're trying to act in a way that demonstrates God's work in our life. We're trying by the will of the flesh to change, and, and we fail. It is God's word and the indwelling spirit of God's holiness that will bring forth the fruit that changes our actions, our attitudes, and even our appearance. Our willpower may do it for a short while, but that's not what's being spoken about here. The maturity in the Christian life is allowing God's word and work and spirit to work in our life through the grace of God in truth to bring forth fruit in us as individual Christians. It's a, it's a present tense possession of the work of the spirit of God and the word of God in the child of God. Go to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22. <clears throat> now, this is the second half, if you will, of a statement because it's a contrast that starts with but. So the, the, the first half, if you will, in verse 17 is the fruit of the flesh. Okay, all the carnal things, all the carnal things that are contrary to the work of the spirit of God, and it runs through that list, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lascivious, etc. That's the fruit of this flesh in this world. But to the Christian, the maturing of fruit comes forth here in 522, but the fruit of the spirit is. So but is a contrast. The fruit of the spirit is God's Holy Spirit. You'll notice the capital S. So the fruit, the work, the outflow of God's Holy Spirit working in us is. So it's different to the fruit of this world. But it says is, so therefore it's a present tense possession for every Christian. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, Temperance against such there is no law. That's God's fruit. Do you know one of the sad things about the age that we live in? When we look back and we read the writings of the saints of old, they loved the simple Christian life. They lived the simple Christian life. And the simple things of God's word inspired them, encouraged them, because individually, at home, guess what? On their own, they prayed. Individually, at home, on their own, they read the Bible. They carried out acts of compassion and kindness. They loved their neighbor as they self. They wanted Christ to be glorified and magnified, and they practiced that in their life. And when they gathered together, you could talk about the simple things like the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, and they would rejoice in those simple, simple things. But nowadays as Christians, we don't spend the time in prayer alone. We don't spend the time reading our Bible alone. A sermon must have some new piece of interesting information so you can make another note in your Bible to add to your knowledge bank. So we can talk a good talk without walking a good walk. And that's where the power has vanished from Christianity today. We've replaced practical Christianity with personal knowledge. We've replaced the power of the Spirit 
with the presence of knowledge. It's the fruit that shows the Christian maturity. We've gone through the singularity, the hope, the word, the truth, and the gospel. We've got the diversity. We want to get that gospel to all the world. But are we stopping short of the maturity? Are we stopping short of allowing the grace of God's word and spirit in our life? Are we quenching and grieving the spirit of God to bring forth the maturity that should go with the singularity and the diversity? Truly, truly, the hardest thing to do in the Christian life is to bring our practice to the level of God's preaching. And we can't do it in the flesh. God's word speaks to us. God's spirit impresses, leads, and guides us, and we fight. The, the, the flesh lusteth against the spirit. You see, knowledge is useful. Study of the word of God is useful, but the knowledge that it gives us will only be helpful to us as Christians in so much as that what is known is applied. What is heard is heeded, that we put it into action. Any knowledge that we have more than that which is used is a super, uh, is, a, a, is a superfluousness. It is a uselessness to us. It is baggage around us. We spend a lot of our lives as Christians living with a useless surplus of knowledge rather than a practice of the Christian life, maturing in the fruits of of the spirit, the fruits of righteousness. You see, it's that application of God's spirit and God's word working together that produces a fruit that prevents the, what's that word? Uh, superfluity of naughtiness. I love that in the scriptures. You know, there's a lot of us Christians today, there's too much of a superfluity of naughtiness, a surplus of naughtiness. You know, the flesh winning out against the spirit. Because we're just not maturing as Christians as we should. We are not allowing the Lord to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Go to James 1.21 and then we'll be done. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Some good practical Christianity, some, some personal powerful Christianity is what we need. Because that's what's going to bring the power back into the church is living the Christian life. Prayer, Bible, Spirit of God bringing forth fruit. James chapter 1, verse number 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, and here it is, and superfluity of naughtiness. That's too much naughtiness. And receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. Doers of the word, superfluity of naughtiness. My friend, how, how are you doing with your Christian maturity? Are you struggling against the superfluity of naughtiness in your Christian life? Are we surrendering and submitting to the Spirit of God and the fruits of the Spirit coming forth in maturity in our life? Are we feeding the Spirit of God with the Word of God? Are we coming before the throne of grace, begging God for growth and maturity and those fruits to take place? Or are we just satisfied with a superfluity of naughtiness, just too much bad stuff, and we just chalk it up to the grace God? Well, God will forgive me in his grace. God understands in his grace. God knows I'm a failure. God knows I'm weak in the flesh. Well, listen, he knows that, but he gave you the presence of his Holy Spirit. And he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is, but in contrast to your flesh, the present tense fruit of the Holy Spirit of God is available to every Christian. That's the maturity. That's the maturity. A lot of Christians sometimes like to get very busy doing things. And that's not a bad thing of itself. But what I've come to see over the years is a lot of people who get very, very busy doing a lot of things 
It's because they're trying to mask the sin in their life. They're trying to compensate. Almost, almost you've been saved by grace, but you're trying to keep yourself balanced by works. And the fruit of the Spirit and the grace of truth of God is not working out in you, and you're just trying to keep busy, trying to keep ahead of God. Trying to, trying to busy the flesh. You know, and a lot of the doing is just about doing. But if you truly, truly look through the, the word of God, and if you look really through the New Testament epistles, a lot of the doing that God wants for us as Christians, that God puts forth for, forth for us, a lot of the doing is about becoming. Becoming the Christians that we should be. Becoming who we should be through the grace of God, the truth of God, and the spirit of God in operation in our life. So the doing is doing what we need to do to become who we need to be, not doing works for works' sake to try and mask who we actually are. That's the maturity of the Christian life. The fruit of Christian living is an evidence of God's grace working and maturing us. The singularity is coupled with the diversity, is coupled with maturity. The true singularity of man's submission to a supreme intelligence is salvation in Christ and submission to the word of God and following the leading of the Spirit of God. That's the true singularity. Don't be led astray by the nonsense of this world. Friend, love the Lord, love his word, love the gospel. Love the world, desire that the gospel will go into all the world. But put some time into allowing the Lord to bring forth fruit and change you, change you. It's the greatest witness this world will ever see. It's the most powerful, powerful outreach tool that you will ever have. Is a gospel changed testimony that speaks of the gospel that changes and showing forth the fruits of maturity, singularity, diversity, maturity. That's God's great plan. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us in these days to know the power of his word and spirit, not only to save lives, but to change lives. Let's not miss that part of it. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless your word. Lord, bless the words that I've spoken tonight, Lord. You empower them, please, Lord. You reach into our hearts, convince and convict us by your Holy Spirit. Lord, change us. Lord, may we not become stagnant in the Christian life, in our Christian life. Let, let's not replace that with busyness. Lord, we can get so busy and it max, masks the truth. We can convince ourselves that we're spiritual because we're busy doing things. Where many times we need to be busy becoming something for Christ. Father, empower us, we pray. Use us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.